Good morning. So good to be here. So honored to be here. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Let's see if this all works now. Reconciliation and international law. I thought I'd start out, though, with um, taking out the uh, last issue of Time magazine, which I got in my mail yesterday, where um, Mikhail Gorbachev has written an article about the fall of the wall 30 years ago. And that's why we're here. And one thing he writes is this. Let's see if I can do this without my glasses. In October 1989, I, that's Mikhail Gorbachev, I attended the festivities in East Berlin, marking the 40th anniversary of the GDR. As I stood on the rostrum, greeting the columns of participants in the parade, I felt almost physically the people's discontent. We knew that they had been carefully pre-selected, which made their behavior even more striking. They were chanting, Pierestroika, Gorbachev, help. I think it's interesting to look back at what Mikhail Gorbachev was maybe the, the player of, number one player of them all, writes about what happens 30 years ago. And my topic today, reconciliation and international law, doesn't have a lot to do with that. But he was speaking a lot about politicians as a factor in making peace at that time and about people, the people's role. And I am speaking today about two other factors in making peace from conflicts. That's reconciliation and international law. And the reason I, as a judge, as a lawyer, speak about this is that I have had the feeling many times, now I'm retired, but I've had the feeling many, feeling many times that law, at least national law in my country, sort of counteracts the reconciliation that we really want as an end to conflicts. Sometimes law helps, but sometimes it counteracts. Take family law, for example, where um, parents fight for custody and contacts with the children. What you really want is a reconciliation where the parents agree on things so that the kids will have a good future with both their parents. But law sometimes counteracts that and makes it difficult for them to agree and to, to actually make life good for their children. And I was wondering, is it sometimes like that in international law too? So I've, I've been looking a little bit at that, and uh, the questions I'm asking myself, let's see if I can find this, yeah, is this. This is the reason I've chosen this topic, uh, reconciliation and international law, because law sometimes counteracts reconciliation, I think, and sometimes supports it. And that may s sound a little bit abstract to you, but let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Israel and Palestine. I studied this a little bit a couple of years ago together with some friends and also a little bit in the framework of the ICD and the ACD actually. And one thing that I found rather soon was that international law to a great extent supports the Palestinian demands and is against uh, the claims of Israel. For example, when it comes to the um, West Bank and the occupation of the West Bank, there it is clear that what, is ha what has happened for many decades now 
is against international law and against Israel. And I found, and many of you probably know this before, that um, in many instances when it comes to this conflict in the Middle East, uh, it is uh, contrary to the Israeli demands. And Israel is in fact not uh, very happy about the role of international law and not very happy, a lot of, it's almost self-evident to many of you, but I say it anyway because it may not be self-evident to everyone. Israel is also very critical to the role of, of the United Nations in the conflict. And as you all know, it is difficult to find a peaceful solution in this conflict. And I believe that to some extent it has to do with, the, uh, with this problem that international law is so heavily against Israel. It means that there is no l real legal possibility to solve this conflict. And um, when I talked to the former Israeli ambassador to Sweden about this, uh, he confirmed that this is a problem, that Israel is feeling that the world uh, does not understand their demands, and they are feeling that international law is not uh, taking into account to, in, in, in the way it should the needs of Israel for security and protection. And that's why international law is not, as they say, working well. So I would say that this conflict, my first case, my first example, is a case where uh, international law is to some extent, or maybe even to a large extent, uh, counteracting the possibilities of reconciliation in the area. My second case is Catalonia, and that may be even more controversial to many because most people, I think, um, have strong feelings about what should be the case in Catalonia, and it's not always the same feelings that the people, as the people of Catalonia have. As you all know, there was about a year ago, a strong movement in Catalonia by some people there to uh, break away to some extent from, from Spain. And in the aftermath of that, um, the leaders, the political leaders, some of them left the country, some of them were, were imprisoned. And now, uh, lately, there have been some rather harsh judgments against those political leaders. Some of them are still not back in Spain or Catalonia, but those who were imprisoned have been sentenced to between three and nine years of prison, I think it is. It's, it's, it seems, feels harsh. And as you all know, um, a lot of people of Catalonia have been out on the streets in Barcelona and other cities um, objecting to, protesting against these um, um, judgments. So the question is, where does international law stand on this? Well, it's clear that Catalonia or the, the people of Catalonia who would, who would want to, to, to have autonomy from Spain do not have any support in international law. It's clear both from Spanish national law and from international law that uh, it was correct by Spain by the Spanish court to make the judgments they did and to convict these, these uh, political leaders of not treason but other, other actions. And as you can see, that standpoint in international law is not getting any support in Catalonia, obviously. Quite the contrary. And one could maybe ask the question, would it be possible to have a law, an international law, in better support of what the people would want? Would it be possible to have an international law that would sort of meet the demands, the hopes, the wishes of a people that 
would like to be an autonomous or at least a little more autonomous from the mother country. Today there is no such possibility. Would it be possible to, to, to move towards reconci re reconciliation by changing international law a little bit? I wrote some about that um, about a year ago when things were, were hot. Uh, would it be possible to change international law a little bit so that, so that people who really want to leave their mother, mother country would, would have the possibility to do it easier? But I had strong opposition. All the, the international lawyers in Sweden said, no, 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 we should not, not touch this. It's correct that Spain can treat the Catalonian, uh, the Catalan, I think one says in English, the Catalan political leaders the way they do. But whatever, whatever the reasonable solution is, it is a case where international law is counteracting reconciliation, I think. And that's my topic here, no other than that. So that was my second case. The third case, Hong Kong. Also very topical today, as you all know. And what, what could possibly be the role of uh, international law when it comes to Hong Kong? Well, one, one very important topic of discussion there is what should be the role of the joint declaration you, pr you probably wouldn't know about this, but in 1984, the Chinese coming in and the British going out uh, had made a joint declaration about Hong Kong in the future that would, be, uh, that would be working from then and on. And in this joint declaration was, for one thing, uh, a statement of universal suffrage. You may not know what that means. I hardly know it, know it myself. But it has to do with the people of Hong Kong uh, being able to make their own choices when it comes to their leaders. So if this joint declaration stands, then the Hong Kong people will have a stronger position in choosing their own leaders. And now, after 1997, when the, uh, when the Chinese took over Hong Kong, uh, the Chinese, that is the mainland China, People's Republic of China, say that this joint declaration from 1984 is not valid anymore. Uh, it was only valid up to 1997. Now it is the constitution of Hong Kong it's called the base law of Hong Kong, the basic law of Hong Kong that stands. And there is no such rule about universal suffrage for the Hong Kong people in that. So an international law question is now, has the joint declaration still uh, validity? Could it still be? used by people who are uh, in favor of the Hong Kong people uh, having their own say, so to speak, which is the, the key issue, of course, in Hong Kong. How much is mainland China, People's Republic of China, going to decide? How much pressure are they going to put? How much force are they going to use in Hong Kong? And this international law issue is the joint declaration standing or not, is therefore an important question in Hong Kong. And I believe that the Chinese leaders would be, uh, would be uh, adhering to uh, an international law analysis uh, about this question. So if the, the a correct and uh, good international law analysis uh, would say that the Chinese should abide by the joint declaration, then that would be good for Hong Kong. I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, but here this to me is an example where international law around Hong Kong could be a help 
for reconciliation because it could help the people in Hong Kong to, uh, to get their way to some extent. I, I listened to a lecture only a week ago in Stockholm by a, a prof an American professor, a resident of Hong Kong, speaking about this issue. And I asked him, what do you think will be the, the situation in Hong Kong 20 years ago? I mean, he was obviously uh, a, uh, an expert in, in Hong Kong and mainland China uh, affairs. And he said, I have no idea whatsoever. It totally depends on what the leaders of China will decide. And it's impossible to know what they will be how they will be thinking and how harsh the leaders will be. Today, there's a tendency towards being strict. Maybe later there will be a new leader who will not be so strict. Whatever is the case and whatever is the answer, uh, it's a really important issue to all of us, I think. What happens in Hong Kong is uh, really uh, a key issue for the world, for the global community in the next 20, 25 years. But I would state this is a case where international law supports the possibilities for reconciliation. May not be all clear why I'm thinking like that, but I hope I made myself fairly clear. Now this, the war against terrorism, is something which we all have to think about and which is very topical to all of us. And I, I try to bring this up as a part of my speech because I think it's, it's maybe the most important um, conflict that we have to deal with today. And the question is, does this, the, our war against terrorism, does that have anything to do with international law and the possibilities of reconciliation at all, or doesn't it? Well, to some extent, it does have to do with international law because one very important issue is what is going to happen if one starts finding um, a possible so solution for, for a peace, however that would look, but, but for some kind of peaceful solution between, say, the West and the very radical Islamists. How would we do in international law with all the crimes that have already been committed? You know that today it's, it's, it's really war in many ways. We saw it last week when, when the leader of the ISIS was, was killed. And uh, how is this going to end? Is there a possible peaceful solution at all? And what does international law have to do with it? Well, international law would demand that the people, the terrorists, are brought to justice. The international law would not allow for a reconciliation where there is not justice for all the horrific terrorist crimes that have been committed. So these, the standpoint of international law is clear. We have to bring them to justice. So it's justice over peace, so to speak. Even if we want peace, we need justice, justice over peace. And that would be one way of saying that, that law could maybe, in that respect at least, counteract reconciliation. Now I'm moving out towards a little, uh, talking a little bit further about this, because I happen to read, not happen to read, but I read a book uh, not long ago by the former leader of Pakistan. She was the prime minister in two periods. You know her, Benazir Bhutto. She wrote a book which was published in 2007 called Islam, Democracy, and the West. 2007 was the same year as she was assassinated after having come back to, to Pakistan to take part in the election at that time and to try to bring about, as, at least that was, that's what she says in the book, 
to try to bring about democracy and to strengthen democracy in Pakistan. Uh, but she was, she was almost murdered just when she came there, and she was assassinated a couple of months later uh, in, uh, I think it was in the beginning of December of, of 2007, and then the book came out at the very end of, the, of, of 2007 or beginning of 2008, only some, about a month after she died. So she had the whole manuscript already written. And it's a very interesting book. I get, I must say I'm a little bit impressed by Benazir Bhutto. I know not everyone likes, liked her, but I think the book is, carries a lot of, uh, a lot of um, wisdom with it. And one thing she says at the end of the book is that the West needs to take some measures to uh, be better understood in the Islamic world. And she brings up four different measures that she thinks that we in the West, if you allow me to say we in the West, I know ev not everyone is from the West here, but if you allow me to say that, because I'm from the West, uh, that we should be taking. And the first one she mentions is to start a Marshall Plan. Will you all know what, what a Marshall Plan, what the Marshall Plan was? That was what came after the, the uh, Second World War and which helped Europe it was an American initiative by, uh, uh, by a man named Marshall, of course, very, very well-known person. And it was bringing in a lot of money, financing into Europe, not the least Germany, to help and to um, make people think well of the US, I guess one would say also. And she says, Benazir Bhutto says that we should do this, the West, the rich West should do this to the, uh, to the Islamic world, to the Islamic states, because what we need is to show them that we have goodwill. We want you to feel uh, equal to us. We don't want to run away. We don't want to just be trying to show you the way things should be run, but we, we want to be goodwill people with you. So we should bring in, uh, in the instances and in where are the places where it's needed, which is not everywhere, of course, financial aid. That's the first, her first idea. The second one is to change the image of the West uh, in the Islamic world in, ma in many other respects. Like we should, for example, uh, make room for study visits to the, vis to the West by young people from the, from the Muslim world. We should inform, make information, campaigns in a good way. We should be uh, uh, using our embassies in, in, in the Islamic countries to inform and to be welcoming and to in all different ways try to show that we are, we are there for you, we are willing to meet you halfway at least, and we are, we are, we are in goodwill. She says, Benazir Bhutto, and I think she says it in a very convincing way, that one very difficult part of the problem today is that uh, people in the Islamic states, the Muslim world, think of us as uh, people who, who, who think they're better than, than, than they. And that is not good, obviously. And uh, the third, she says, is that we should create organization either among states or among um, organizations, associations like 
Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and all kinds of organizations that have uh, a, a, a uh, idea of, of uh, trying to, to aid democracy and human rights. And we should have an umbrella organization, either of states and or of organizations that, that would always jump in in protecting young democracies. Instead of just letting things happen, uh, we should be there for the young democracies to aid. Because young democracies often need support. And she says we should be thinking about this, and today the United Nations does not work well enough, so we should have an organization directed towards this. Because democracy is so important. And the fourth one she says, and this is maybe difficult, but this is what she mentions anyway, is that there should be measures taken, not least by the Western states, to solve some important conflicts where the Muslim world is feeling that it has not been listened to enough. And she mentions uh, Kashmir uh, on the uh, border between India and Pakistan, and she mentions Chechnya uh, in uh, Russia, and she mentions um, Palestine, of course, where she says that there is a sentiment among uh, the Muslim people in the world that the uh, Islamic interests are not heard, are overlooked. So we should, we should, as a community, a global community, do all we could to, to try to solve those important conflicts. Well, I can't help but being a little bit um, impressed by Benazir Bhutto and her ideas. And I do think that at least we should, in the West, do some thinking about what we could do in a more active way to try to have the war have the, uh, the war against terrorism make a new direction. We can't have it the way she, it is now, she, uh, I believe. And we can't, uh, we can't just leave it as it is. We should do something to, to try to, to get things moving. Uh, she says in her book, rightly I believe, that poverty Ignorance and lack of hope is what nourishes terrorism. Poverty, ignorance, and lack of hope. That's where the terrorism starts. And uh, I think that's the, the fact today. Uh, my last picture is this. Um, this is impossible, isn't it? It is impossible, isn't it, to fight terrorism and get away with the terrorism threat. But the Berlin Wall fell, didn't it? That was impossible, too. So maybe we could do something about the terrorist threat, too. I thought I'd end by reading the last words of this article by Mikhail Gorbachev in Time magazine this week. His last paragraph is this. We drew a final line under the Cold War. Our goal was a new Europe, a Europe without dividing lines. The leaders who succeeded us have failed to achieve that goal. A modern security architecture a strong mechanism for preventing and resolving conflicts have not been created in Europe. Hence, the painful problems and conflicts that beset our continent today. I urge world leaders to face up to those problems and resume dialogue for the sake of the future. That's Mikhail Gorbachev. Thank you.
Thank you for your speech, um, Laida, and I would like to ask you about two questions about, uh, I think, uh, about your speech, you said protection of young democracies, and I think nowadays we have a problem such a, um, like, uh, protection of young, young democracies is uh, meddling with uh, inter uh, interior affairs, so what do you recommend of this thing? Uh, protection of young democracies is meddling with uh, uh, um, interior affairs because they are co it's confusing uh, both two parts. So, yeah. Well, it's it's Benazir Bhutto who says this, and I haven't thought it through, but it's obvious that when a democracy starts rising, which we saw and have seen the in the last five, 10 years, a couple of times, it's really, really, really vulnerable. And often it happens that um, dictatorship comes after and it's no, it's no, there's no way at all for, for the, the young democracies to, to sort of stand up to dictatorship. I'm not gonna take any examples here because it's gonna, going to be too provocative. But uh, I believe she is right that if, when things start happening um, in these young democracies that are, th that are threatening it, I think that if we had an organization of states uh, standing up saying, we don't want this to happen, this is what people have said, have had their say, and this is what they, are the, uh, they, they wanted, and we want them to have a chance. And if there was an organization consisting of, say, 10, 15 strong human rights organizations say, saying, saying the same thing in media all over the world, uh, give them a chance. Don't mess with this. Then I think that often that would, that would uh, play, play an important role. And that could be a factor to save the young democracies. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but that's my reflections on it. Sir, um, I'm sorry. What's the essence of international laws to go back to the lady? Um, if we have these young democracies and international laws are not helping and international organizations are not helping, why do we have them? Yeah, well that's a very good question. Uh, I really can't answer it because there is, as far as I can recollect now, no real mechanism in international law to protect uh, young democracies from falling through dictatorship. There are statements saying that, that uh, democracies need to be respected and should be respected, but if a dictatorship, if a dictator and the military starts acting against such uh, a, uh, a um, young democracy and young democracy movement, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be impossible to adhere to uh, international law. And as you know, international law, whatever it says, is not going to be protected when uh, there is uh, strong political and sometimes military interests in driving the young democracies out. There is no way today of protecting international law against those interests. And I think that's really the main problem as I see it. The law may be there, which it isn't always, but even if it is there, it's not going to be taken into full account. I believe that we would need a, 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 an international, global international force to protect international law, but that's so far away. But that's, I think that's what we really need. 
That's so far away, though. Mr. Lombards, there are many more questions, but I need to actually keep my rule as moderator. We actually have to conclude, we're, we're tight on time, but you're here for the next few days. So I would say during the lunch break, et cetera, 